If you can open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 16. As you know, we're in the middle of a series called Real Godliness in Real Life, attempt to address a number of, of topics through biblical passages related to the topic of godliness. How, how are we called to follow and serve the Lord? What is our responsibility as Christians? And this is the final message in that series. We're, we're very much looking forward to launching an extended series in the book of Psalms uh, next week. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite you and encourage you uh, to begin reading the Psalms, actually, this coming week. Um, th- there's actually going to be a you know, four months or so, we'll go right up to the month of December uh, with this series. And uh, that's plenty of time, actually, uh, to read the entire book of Psalms. Psalms are, are often short. You can read two or three at a time, often. And if you just read consistently, you could easily read the book of Psalms uh, by the time we finish the series. I thought that'd be a wonderful thing for us to do as a church if you don't already have a reading plan. Um, But even if you do, um, I would encourage us to do this. Let's enjoy the Psalms over these next number of months. Looking forward to all that they have to teach us. Uh, But for this morning, uh, we're going to remain with Luke, who's been actually serving us a number of times in this series. The physician Luke, uh, who writes with the physician's eye for detail. And uh, he is going to bring a a parable to us from the lips of Jesus this morning. So let's read in chapter 16 of Luke, and and let's remember this is God's authoritative and inspired and unchanging word, and it has power to transform us, and it calls us to respond with joy and faith this morning. Let's begin reading in verse 1. He, that is Jesus, also said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig, and I am ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So, summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? He said, A hundred measures of oil. He said to him, Take your bill. And sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. So that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Now, if you're like me, when you first read this story, there's an initial reaction uh, of perplexion. Um, What is going on here? Uh, (laughs) And why are we choosing this story to... Uh, use in this limited series on the topic of godliness. I I think, at least from my own life, uh, this is, on the surface, a challenging story to read. Uh, You wonder uh, why Jesus chose to tell this story, what the ultimate point is, and what we're supposed to get out of something that is so obviously filled with unscrupulous people. Um, what, what, what is the point here? Jesus was just, just an off day uh, in the parable world. No, it, no, it wasn't. Um, a, a key point as we get into this story is remembering how to understand parables. Uh, parables are not to be understood, first of all, as hero stories, and that's how we tend to come to them. We tend to come to them saying, okay, this is, a, this is sort of Aesop's fables except with Jesus. Uh, it has a moral. We're to look at the, the good character, uh, and, and where's the good character? I, I can't find him. Uh, where is this good character? Well, I, boy, this is odd. We're, we're celebrating dishonesty. This is very strange. Uh, what, what's the point of the good? Look, it, it's better if you come at this and just remember it's a story. 
Don't jump into the interpretation. First, enjoy the story. Let, let the story affect you. Let the point of the story affect you. And I think one point of clarity that kind of help us is when Jesus says at the end, the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. You see that down there in verse 8. The sons of this world. So one, one way to think about this is that Jesus is essentially describing two ordinary sinners. All right? So if, if Jesus had started this in the American vocabulary, uh, once upon a time, uh, there were two ordinary sinners. Uh, we, we might think, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. I get that. There's no hero in this story. And there really isn't a hero in this story. Okay, am I a little loud? I feel like I'm a, a feeding back a bit. Is it okay out there? You need any help? I can linger and just talk generally while they figure out the sound. We can do that. <laughs> that's great. Good. Um, that's a way of coming at this that I think helps peel away some of the confusion. This isn't a hero story. This is just a story. So let's sort of jump into it and, and try to understand it as a story first, and then we'll apply the main point to it. So, so there's a rich man. There's a rich man. Once upon a time, there was a rich man, and he had a manager. Not all that surprising. We might think in the modern day of, of a rich athlete or maybe a musician or, or some kind of artist uh, that has a massive amount of wealth but is devoting their time to making more wealth, and so they, they need someone to manage uh, their finances. And so this rich person has a manager, but then he finds out that this manager has been wasting his possessions. Again, not hard to imagine if you heard a story, you know, on the news today. So-and-so artist has fired their manager because they were found embezzling, uh, using the artist money for lavish expense accounts and personal trips to Hawaii and, and so forth. I mean, it's not, not difficult to imagine in the modern era, right? This is what Jesus is saying. There's this rich guy, and he's got a manager who's wasting his possessions. But the rich man finds out about it. And so in verse 2, he calls him to him. And again, don't jump into the interpretation. We're just enjoying the story. It's a story about two guys right now. He calls him to him, and he says, what is this I hear about you? Again, not difficult to imagine. Two ordinary sinners. What, what did I hear about this trip to Hawaii on my dime? And what are these lavish expense accounts I keep hearing about? And I keep hearing reports that you're using up all the wine in my wine cellar. What, what is going on? What is this clothing you have on? Where did you buy that? This is the idea, right? He's confronting him for wasting his possessions. So severe is his rebuke that he says, turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. You're done, he says. You're done. Now, apparently, this, this rich man has so many possessions that he can't just ask him to turn in his card right there and walk him out the building. Apparently, the rich man needs him to bring his accounts in. So there's this brief moment of time, and actually a key point in the parable is this, this brief moment of time where the manager still has his technical credentials, although his permanent firing is a sure thing. So you notice that in the story. There's this odd sense that this rich guy is not very bright. That's why they have in corporate America the whole scene where we, when you fire somebody who has inner secrets, they're escorted out of the building. Why? Because once you know you're fired, well, then all that you know puts the company in danger. That's the idea. And if you don't really trust each other, it's not wise to let him keep his manager card while simultaneously telling him you're fired. That's a bad idea. That's what we're to picture here. He keeps his card or his ring or whatever he had, some kind of credential that allows him to still operate as the representative of the manager. And actually, in this case, he's even able to make almost legal decisions for the manager. He has what we might think of it as a power of attorney. He has the ability to actually bind the manager and represent him in some profound way. So this, this rich guy is not very shrewd at all. You're fired. Go figure out all the accounts and, and, and bring me the money. That's the idea here. There's this, this rapidly fleeting moment of time, and, and that's what confronts this, this manager. He says to himself in verse 3, again, enjoy the story. What shall I do? <laughs> what shall I do since my master is taking the management away from me? You picture the master stormed out of the office, and he's sitting there thinking, okay, I got, boy, uh, I'm about to lose my key card. What can I do? And he takes stock of his abilities, and apparently he's not impressed. He says, I'm not strong enough to dig. 
So that's out. And I'm too ashamed to beg. So that's out. And obviously this man is used to a certain lifestyle. He says, what shall I do? Because I don't have any resources. Once I lose the resources of my master for benefiting my life, once this source of income is gone, what, what can I do? What, what, what am I doing? I, 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 I'm weak. We all know that. I can't dig. Digging. Oh, my goodness. I couldn't possibly dig. And, and certainly, I don't want to beg. Boy, that would be too embarrassing. After all those lavish corporate trips, begging would really be awkward. I can't be begging. What shall I do? I know what I will do. Verse 4. I know what I'll do. I will do something so that his debtors will think favorably of me. I'll use this final moment with the master's signet ring, key card, position, credentials, and I'll get myself a provision for the future. So you have the summoning of the master's debtors in verse 5. What a remarkable scene. You have the sense that he's, he's kind of made his way to the accounting house and he, he ushers them in the side door. Come in, come in, come in, come in, quick. Come in. How much do you owe? A hundred measures of oil. That's a lot of oil. A hundred measures of oil. It's your lucky day. I have decided that it's appropriate for us to cut that in half. Wow. Why? You know what? You're a good guy. I want to do you something good. Let's just cut it in half. Just just remember that we're buddies, okay? We're going to cut it in half. 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 You, you might imagine in modern terms, I, I, don't, I don't know quite how much the, the cost of this, but imagine somebody comes in and says, how, how much do you owe my master? Oh, 10,000 bucks. It's five. It's five. Sorry that. Well, well, why did the man? Well, I, I just think you're a good guy. You're, I, I, I want to give you a break. Send Jim in on your way out. Jim comes in. How much do you owe? I, I, I owe, you know, 100 measures of wheat. That's a lot of wheat. Make it 80. We'll call it good. Write it down right now. Make it permanent. Make it legal. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You're a good guy. I don't want it to be a burden for you. What are you doing next week? I mean, that, that's the idea here. He's, he's ingratiating himself abruptly and suddenly to these individuals so that though they don't technically owe him anything, they functionally owe him a lot. Their debt just got, and one guy cut in half, the other guy gets 20% off of it. There, there's a sense in which now they, they are personally uh, indebted to him. There's a sense that he has become their beneficiary. In this final fleeting moment, while he is literally on his way out the door, suddenly he has these two friends who look on him as if somehow he has done them incredible financial good. Well, the master finds out about this, as he inevitably would. And here's where we get the, the real sense. These are just two sinners. The master now is stuck. What can he do? If he says, no, he didn't have the right to do that, then he comes across as some greeting miserly Scrooge. He doesn't want to do that. On the other hand, he, he doesn't want to lose the money, so he makes the best of a worse scenario. He, he just commends them. You, you get the sense of grudging respect among thieves here. Well, well done. Well done. Yeah, that was, that was impressive. On your way out, literally, on your way out the door, you grab the candlestick. Well done. That was, that was well done. That's the impressive here. One, one kind of unscrupulous guy commending another. He's basically saying, yeah, you, you know, you, you did what you could with what you had. You did what you could with what you had. In, in, the, in the midst of your defeat, you snatched a victory. Well done. Well done. And then, and then Jesus allows us to feel, I think, I think probably because in this parable it's possible for us to misunderstand. He, he brings the point of the parable home. It's very important. Jesus is not commending these dishonest people. He calls them sons of this world. They're just ordinary sinners doing what they can to get ahead. But what, what is he commending in this? Not, not his shrewdness, not his dishonesty. He's saying, look, according to what this guy knows, he's a son of this world, he is shrewd. What he means by that is he's doing what he can for the future he's aware of with what he has. He's doing what he can for the future he's aware of with what he has. He's planning for his future. He's doing what he can with what he has for the future that he's aware of. He's saying there's a, there's a shrewdness, there's a type of wisdom here. 
Like, if you're not worried about morality and you're not worried about honesty, you're just thinking about, look, I need some place to eat next week. This guy's pretty smooth. He's pretty wise. He's pretty intelligent. And actually, Jesus compares him to the sons of light, not in terms of his morality, but in terms of his foresightfulness. His forward looking, his shrewdness, in other words, his, his right use of what he has now in light of his future condition. That's what he's commending. He's saying, look, this, this guy, this son of this earth with his limited perspective, he's looking to his future. And he's saying, you know, many sons of light with their perspective do not do as well as this man did. Many sons of light who also have a future that they're aware of do not act with the same intentionality and urgency and foresightfulness as this man. They, they don't do with what they have what they can for their future. And that's the point of the story. Use your money to invest in your future. That's the point. It's, it's very, very simple. He's saying, look, even, even, even this sinner, this, this like unscrupulous guy, even he's aware of his future. And he's using this very fleeting moment with a very vanishing power uh, to do what he can for that moment when all that he has now is taken away from him. Jesus makes it explicit again. If you look down there in verse 9, he, he makes it more of a direct command. I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. We don't know exactly why Jesus used the phrase unrighteous wealth. He may even be subtly rebuking some who, who gained their wealth by unrighteousness. We might think of Zacchaeus, for example, might be addressing them. He might just be addressing possibly the, the temptation that wealth is. In any case, the point is the same. That Look, however you have your money right now, use it to benefit yourself in a future time when it is gone. And the reality begins to peek through the parable in that last phrase, eternal dwellings. This man was looking for temporary provision like next week when he can't stay at the mansion any longer. This sons of light, they're to look up beyond just next week and into a place when, like this manager, all of their current stewardship will be removed from them and they have need of friends who can welcome them into eternal houses. So that the, the reality, our theology of the future, begins to peer through when we feel the effect of Jesus' words. Now, it's, it's not clear here whether he means uh, just, uh, you know, or, or, or like friends, as in uh, people who will be there in heaven who are welcoming you and inviting you in. He, he may include that meaning. Do, do good to those who are going to have a place in that future place when your life comes to an end. You, you want those people to be celebrating your arrival. But, but I think more probably, he is including that friend who actually has the power to invite us into an eternal dwelling when our current management is done. I think that's where the reality kind of peers through the parable. This man is saying, look, who, he looks down the list and he says, look, who, who, who can provide for me? When this management is over, I turn in the card for the last time. I walk out those gates, and I'm left with nothing but my own resources. He's saying, look, sons of light, look forward to the future. There will come a moment when all of your current resources will be abruptly gone from you. And in that moment, who are friends that can welcome you and, and, and receive you into eternal houses? Who is that? Well, certainly fellow Christians fit that category, but more importantly, there is a God. There is a God. So here, here's the almost shocking spiritual effect of the parable. The real shock of this parable, it's, it's not the use of two sinners to make a point. The real shock of this parable is Jesus pictures God as one who allows himself to, as it were, receive benefit from his own money and how we give it. 
God almost puts himself in the place of, of these people that come in and say, wow, look, look at what you gave me. Now, obviously, in an ultimate sense, that's ridiculous. We can't give anything to God. But he, it's almost as though Jesus is saying, look, you have the ability with this fleeting moment when you have a stewardship over physical money to invest in people and one person in particular who is delighted to welcome you in, where your money can reveal, in that sense, your trust in him for your future. Now, very important caveat here. Parables, they're making a single point. So we know, because of the rest of Scripture, money does not earn our way into heaven. You can't buy God's salvation. Right? So that's not what this is saying. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. It is Christ's riches that purchase heaven for us. This is not talking about the foundation of our salvation. But it is talking about the receipt of it. Money can't buy you salvation, but it is the receipt that you have been purchased and claimed by one who will receive you into heaven. The way we use our, our current money right now, it doesn't make God our friend in the way these guys were made his friend by his giving. But it does reveal that we trust God ultimately as the one who will welcome us in when all of our earthly resources are done. Jesus actually makes this point over and over and over again about money. He says, look, do not, do not store up treasures on this earth because they're all going to go away one day. Store up treasures in heaven because there is nothing that can take them away from you there. Why is that? Well, it's because God is in heaven and God watches over those who entrust themselves to him. That's exactly the point of this parable. He's saying, look, there, there is a sense in which Christians do not look far enough ahead. They do not look far enough into the future. They do not use their money with a sense of their future need. How foolish would it have been in this man's paradigm to waste his final few moments as manager? In this man's sinful paradigm, what, what a waste of time if he wanders into the coffee room and enjoys one last coffee break instead of calling in those two guys on the side and writing down their bill. That's what Jesus is saying. No, he's, he's thinking about his future. He's not wasting these final moments. He's doing something now as an investment in a future moment when all that he currently possesses will be taken from him. And that's exactly the point for Christians. Invest your money in that one and those ones who will be there when you lose everything that you currently have. That's the point of this parable. Invest your money in that one. Give and use your money in such a way that that one delights and celebrates the investment of your money into a future when all of your current money is worthless. There is this fleeting, vanishing time in which money can be used in a way that benefits you in the future. So use it that way. That's Jesus' point of the parable. Look, look make friends for yourselves. It's, it's, it's remarkable condescension, kindness of the God that he would allow himself to be described that way. But it's often the, 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 the case that when the Bible talks about the rewards of heaven and the provision of heaven, it is as though God blesses and rewards us for the, the very things that he gave us in the first place. It's a little bit like our, our godliness in general. God says, well done, when all along it was God's power that was at work creating these things in us. It's just a sign of God's grace upon grace. He saves us in the first place. He gives us all that we have. There's nothing that we could give back to him that we created or earned on our own. He gave it to us. And yet somehow he chooses to treat us as though we are giving something to him. It's a remarkable thing. It's, it's a sign of the, the humility and graciousness of God. He treats us as though we are blessing him, as if we are giving to him. Even, you, you could say this very cautiously, even as if God makes himself responsible to return to us what we have given to him. Now, now this is where the lie of the prosperity gospel is contradicted. God does not promise to give to us in this life 
everything that we give to him. Now, in some cases, God does bless when we give, and there's certainly moments where people are generous and they see God's provision. Certainly that's the case. But the lie of the prosperity gospel says, look, if you give to God, God will give you a heaven on earth. That is not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying, look, if you give to God, God will give you a new house or a new car, a new watch or a new family and new health, and he'll take your cancer away. No, that is not what the scripture teaches. But the scripture does teach a kind of future prosperity for those that invest in God. It's just a prosperity that is only promised for us to receive in heaven. A return on what we give. Now let me make two applications on what it means for us to invest in that eternal one when our time of stewardship is done. Just just two applications I think relate to this parable. First of all, the fleeting nature of our stewardship. The fleeting nature of it. All right, like this ungodly manager, our stewardship of earthly wealth is very, very temporary. It's very temporary. Now, we are deceived in that because we tend to assume, well, we have a lifetime to do what we want with this money. But, but God says, no, it's, it's more like this guy who is literally on his way out the door. There's an urgency in his calling of those debtors. And Jesus, I think, would say, look, there's an urgency in how you use your earthly possessions. You only have so much time. Your, 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 your ability to do anything to invest in eternity is fleeting. It's vanishing. Once the time comes when you're out the door, when you're outside the road, when your eyes close in death, all the moments you had to invest in the kingdom are over. They're done. The investment is made at that point. The market closes. The bell rings. There is no more time for investment. There can be no more earthly to eternal transactions taking place. It's over at that point. So there's a sense like this manager where our, our moment to do something that represents the Lord, that if we can say it this way cautiously, gives benefit to our God and to his people. It, it is fleeting. It is, it is vanishing. It is, it is a manager on his way out the door who grabs a side room on his way out. That is our lifetime. I think many times Christians, when they think about uh, being generous, and throughout the scriptures, generosity is consistently described as that thing which stores up treasure in heaven. Generosity to the building of God's church, generosity uh, to those who are in need. That's consistent in the Old Testament. They were called to support the work of ministry in the temple. They were also called to leave a portion of their gathering for the poor. We see that same call in the New Testament to support the work of the gospel is commended and called for. To bless those who are in need is commended and called for throughout the New Testament. There is severe warnings about the danger of wealth. It's not immoral to have wealth. It's just very dangerous. Money, the New Testament would say, is dangerous. It's not sinful. It's just dangerous. And so one way you can guard yourself from the danger is giving it away. Liberally, freely, with an eye towards that future moment. It's almost as though, when I was a kid, we watched... um, uh, DuckTales. You may watch DuckTales. We watch DuckTales, okay? And in DuckTales, you had that one of the key characters was Scrooge McDuck, and he's built off Ebenezer Scrooge, the character in Christmas Carol. And one of the repeated scenes in the movie or the shows is when he will, he will dive into his vault full of gold coins with the bathing suit on. He'll sort of swim around in them and the slowness of cartoons. And you get the sense that he's rarely happier than when he's literally physically surrounded by his treasures, well, in one episode, um, he uh, magically, uh, is, it, all of his treasures are taken from him. They're removed. They're gone. And he's forced to confront a future with everything gone, without the proximity of his treasures. That's what Jesus is pointing us to. He's saying, look, imagine if you can that you're, you're in this moment and, and time is, is sifting away. And there's this moment when, when all the treasure that is here will abruptly be gone. And yet, in giving it away, you can toss it into a place of safety. 
So you can keep it for now, but there will be a moment when it is gone. And it is all gone, never to be gained again. But if you toss it towards eternity and eternal things and giving and blessing and generosity, well, that money you will keep. That money will be returned to you by the one who has power in that moment. Unlike you who will have no power in that moment, the one who has power in that moment will, will see what you have given and he will return that to you. Look, this is what he's saying. Look, Christians do not look far enough ahead. Invest in that future moment. And is, is it bad to save for retirement so that we can serve our family? No, I, I don't think it's bad. Is it bad to ever purchase things for ourselves? No, of course it's not bad. Jesus is not assigning evil to buying things or to saving. What he's saying is think wisely about the future moment when you will have none of these things and you will truly, everything you have will be taken and the only thing you will have is what you have given. That's how he's saying, look, look for the future. He, he's not coming as this harsh taskmaster saying, look, you got to give your money, and that's just your job. He's saying, look, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. The money, it's going to be gone. Very quickly, it's going to be gone. He comes as this, this gracious investment advisor. And he says, it, it's going to be gone. You're going to be like this steward. You're going to be walked out the door. Your eyes will close. Gone. But you can give, you can be generous, you can be ready to share, you can be ready to invest in eternal things. And in that moment, you will see the benefit of investing in the ultimate eternal friend. We want to think about the fleeting nature of our stewardship. Brothers and sisters, let, let me appeal to you. Let me appeal to you. Look, if, if your life is characterized by non-existent or rare generosity. You are in a dangerous future position. You're in a dangerous future position. I'm, I'm saying this out of love for you. I, I don't know who you are because we don't know who gives to people or to the church. I, I don't know that intentionally as a pastor. So I'm just saying this on the basis of God's word. If your life is rarely or never characterized by generosity, if you're someone who says, well, we give you know, to people or to the church when we can, and what that turns out to mean is when we have an unexpected influx of income, we'll, we'll carve off some of it. But generosity is not a regular part of our life. Look, Jesus would say, look, your time is fleeting. Your time is, you're on your way out. Don't waste time. Invest. Be generous. Give to people or to the work of the gospel. Give generously and abundantly. Why? Because it's all going to go. It's all going to go. Do not wait any longer to build generosity into your lifestyle. The time is fleeting. It is now. Now is the time. And, and let me just say this. If, if you look at your life and your style of life and your pattern of life, you say, I don't know how in the world, how in the world could we add generosity as a budget item? Look, you might have to make major changes to make generosity a major budget item. It, it, it is not the case that you can be generous with something you don't miss. That's the definition of generosity. Generosity isn't like we found some toys we never played with and we donated them to Goodwill. Uh, no, it's not like, well, I, boy, I found some change and so I, I kind of drop it in as it goes. That's not generosity. That's house cleaning. House cleaning is not a good investment in the future. Oh, look at this shirt I never wear. I should give it to somebody. No, that's, that's probably serving you more than it's serving them. Generosity is taking things that you deeply value and giving them away. Sacrifice in the Bible is not measured by how much we give. It's measured by how much we keep. Investment in the future, when we get there, will not be measured by how much we, 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 we've, we've given. It'll be measured by, well, how, how much did you keep? What will seem foolish in that moment of eternity stretching before us and the reality of the brevity of life pressing on us is, why didn't I give away more? If we can apply it to our sense of time, I've, I've done this before. Look, if eternity was 100 years, if, if you can imagine that, if, if, you know, say eternity's you know, 100 years, th think of it like a weekend. Think of it like a weekend. C could you be generous for a weekend? Could you be limited for a weekend in order to benefit for 100 years? Th think of it that way if you said, look, look, you're going to have to really be limited 
Friday, Saturday, Sunday, okay? It's going to be tough. You're going to have to give away things you love. You're going to have to live smaller. You're going to have to live cheaper. You're going to have to live without enjoying some of the pleasures of this life. But it's a weekend. Now, after that, all the things you gave up, they're going to receive abundant return in the one who is generous beyond definition for 100 years. Now, what father, if he said that to Now, here's son, here's what I want you to do. If you will go without for a weekend, you will receive the benefit of it for 100 years. That's the perspective that the God of eternity has when he calls us to give generously. He's not this harsh taskmaster, you know, you've got to give. He's saying, look, it's, it's a weekend. It, you can't understand it. It's, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It, it's such a short period that's fleeting. It's a manager on his way out the door. Look, tr- trust me, any, anything that you give generously right now, the return is, is ridiculous because of the length of time you have to enjoy it. I, 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 somebody told me recently that if you, I, I, I heard this and then I read it, if you invested $100 in Amazon in like 1990, it'd be worth like $170,000 now. I don't know what we were doing in 1990, <laughs> but we should have been investing in Amazon. So think about that from God's perspective in eternity. Look, look I, I know it's hard to give up whatever you have to give up. I, I know it's hard not to go on the nicer vacation, not to have the smaller house, you know, to eat out less. I, I know it's, it's hard to actually look at hard things. Like we're going to have to downsize. To be generous, we're going to have to downsize. But God says, trust me, there, there is a friend. And he, he's not just some guilty, indebted, you know, wheat farmer. He's God. And that's the second point I want to make where we we see that the reality outpaces this parable. There's the fleeting nature of our stewardship. There's also the generous nature of our God. The generous nature of our God. Look, remember who our God is. Our God came himself to save us. How would you define God's level of sacrifice and generosity? You define it by the coming of Jesus. God sent himself to save us. That's the generous God that we serve. The friend we're talking about here, the ultimate friend, is a friend who is generous beyond imagining. Again, he's not some grudging oil farmer or some oil worker, right? He's not, well, you know, I guess I got to do something, 50 measures of oil, that's a lot. No, this is the God who gave when we were giving him nothing, He gave his son when we were giving him nothing. When we were taking from his glory, he was giving to us. What will God be like when we are giving to him? That's the logic of Romans 5 when it talks about the love of God. It says, look, God loved us when we were enemies. And if he loved us when we were enemies, well, then certainly the love of God is going to be poured out on us when we actually have some love of God present in our lives. Look, this is the glory of the gospel. It reminds us that God's generosity comes to us first, and then it produces in us a generosity towards him and towards others, and then his generosity overflows in rewarding us for the very thing he planted in us in the first place. Look, when we look at the gospel, we remember we will never be able to outgive God. We don't have to earn salvation. But, brothers and sisters, we live in an era where money is an idol and a danger, and we must receive the word of our Savior, the Prince of Heaven, who gave up the glory of Heaven for the joy of bringing salvation to His people. We must receive from Him that eternal perspective and say, I want to make you my treasure, and I want to invest in you as my ultimate eternal friend, and I will give away gladly what I'm going to lose anyway, so that I can declare, I trust you for that moment when my eyes close, and my breath expels for the last time, and I open my eyes and I see you face to face. And you will celebrate your work in me of giving in reflection of how you gave to me. Brothers and sisters, our money reveals who we trust for our future. Let me urge you And again, I don't know the budgets of people in this church, so I'm just saying this based on God's word. Let me urge you, if generosity is not a part 
of your life right now. Let me urge you, remember the generous nature of our God and that nothing you give will not be outgiven by him when we see our eternal inheritance. There is no sacrifice you will make right now greater than his sacrifice in sending Jesus. And having sent Jesus, surely he will delight to shower his people with eternal blessings when we see him face to face. If you do not make generosity a part of your life, you are in great spiritual danger. But if you do, you can have great spiritual anticipation because of the generous nature of our God. Now, brothers and sisters, if this is the first time you've heard this kind of call or message or you haven't thought about it or you, you don't want to think about it, let, let, let me urge you to take some steps of action. Talk to one of the pastors. Talk to your small group leaders. How do, I, how do I begin to build generosity into my life? How do I change my lifestyle so that generosity is a major budget item? How do I do that? I, I want to do that. How do I do that? I don't, I don't know how to do that. I'm, I'm up to my eyeballs right now in bills, and I, I don't know how to change my life. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take some time, but be urgent about it and begin now. If you are giving generously... Brothers and sisters, let me commend you. There is a friend who knows every sacrifice we make and who cannot be outgiven and who has given himself for us. And that is the friend we are investing in. Every time we invest in his kingdom, every time we share what we have with those in need, we we are, in effect, giving back to the one who gave himself for us and who will receive us into his home just at the end of the weekend. Invest our money. Let's do this. Let's do this as a church. Let's invest our money in eternity. Let's begin. Let's begin now. Let's make generosity a mark of our lifestyle. Future blessing is coming. When the Lord returns or we close our eyes in death, let us invest ourselves in him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I want to pray and and intercede for myself, Lord, for our church family, that you would make us a generous people. Lord, there's not a person here, including myself, Lord, all all of us are aware of the, the lure and the lullaby of this world's wealth and comforts and pleasures. Lord, our short sighted perspective. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us eyes to see the future. But I pray also for those who feel the future is scary and generosity is scary. Knowing how you can live without that gold around you is scary. But I pray that your comforting hand would make generosity a joy. Lord, generosity is part of our call to godliness. And so I pray, Lord, that you would give us grace to be godly, to be like our God. And help us to trust you as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen.